coming up next on Legislative Week in Review. The one that happened in Seattle, uh, that collapsed in Seattle last spring, killed four people, including two members of the public. Tower crane teardowns get top scrutiny. Accountability is an important part of, of public safety. Assault weapons points to a testy hearing in the House. But the accountability happens after the incident. And what we're hoping for is to give people who are involved in those incidents a chance to survive them. Just because we say it's illegal to purchase from the internet, doesn't mean it's not happening. And the legislature looks to ban flavored vape permanently. Hello, I'm Troy Kirby with Legislative Week in Review, covering the 2020 legislative session for its second week. Today's episode includes looks at bills concerning artificial intelligence in job interviews, regulation of firearms, and the cannabis industry. The Senate Labor and Commerce Committee hearing is now in session. The Senate Labor and Commerce Committee met January 20th, discussing Senate Bill 6171, which regulates tower crane disassembly requiring labor and industries to be on site when a crane is taken down. Senator Karen Kaiser advocated for the bill in response to the April 27, 2019 crane collapse in Seattle. We added an, a, new, um, a new fine in this bill that applies when there is a fatality with tower cranes. Tower cranes go up in urban areas for the most part, and so they have impact on the public. And the one that happened in Seattle, uh, that collapsed in Seattle last spring, killed four people, including two members of the public. Iron workers, Local 86, supported the bill as a safety measure for their workers. What we support specifically are uh, any laws or uh, policies that improve the safeties on all the safety of all projects in order to be able to send people home safely uh, to their families at the end of each day. Critics of the bill said the crane collapse was due to existing rules not being followed. What has happened is we believe those statutes that are on the books today, as Senator Braun and Senator King outlined, worked in the case. I mean, we obviously are very, we're concerned about the accident and don't want to see that happen at any time, but rules were broken, citations were issued. Now, whether we agree that they were high enough, but the department issued penalties, and so what the statutes that were on the books worked, in our opinion. A concern was how cumbersome it would be on the construction industry to have LNI present during a crane teardown. What if the department doesn't um, receive the 48-hour notice or they can't comply with the 48-hour notice? The notice has been provided, but now the crane uh, they tell the crane supplier that they don't have manpower available. You have many levels of companies involved in different things from mobilizing mobile cranes to street closures to technicians to everything and simply just saying that we have to reschedule it because the department can't adapt or, or serve the need is kind of concerning. Um, same thing in an emergency situation, uh, say there's a structural deficiency with the foundation, it demands immediate action where it's, uh, do we have to wait 48 hours before we can disassemble the crane or can we proceed immediately? How would situations like that be resolved? Um, what authority does the department, the department have on site? Will they have the authority to stop work immediately? Will they be in charge of the erection crew? Will they be in charge of the situation? Um, um, how will the department determine if the procedures are followed? Are they going to receive training? Uh, are they going to be familiar with every single model and manufacturer of tower crane and all of their procedures and what step-by-step -step is supposed to be done? Um, and again, the same thing. Where is the department going to get the inspectors to enforce this? Uh, is it in the intent of the department to hire from industry and take away some of our best trained professionals that we put a lot of effort in training for years and years and years. Uh, in fact, just this morning before this meeting, I was notified that the department has made a job offer to one of my service technicians to come to work for him, and that particular service technician does not have a background in tower cranes. His primary background is in the installation and um, operation and maintenance of external elevators. So that's a real concern for us. This is a pivotal moment in history to heal our communities and create a more perfect union. Thank you. Both chambers on January 20th 
honored Dr. Martin Luther King's sacrifice on the House and Senate floors. Dr. King answered that question not just with deeds and words, but with action, collaborative action. When they threw him in a Birmingham jail, he wrote letters that inspired America. And when he gave his life to the cause of civil rights, social justice, for all of us, his ideas and legacy lived on. It means that we've got to stay together. We've got to stay together and maintain unity. You know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a familiar formula for doing it. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. Because whenever slaves get together, uh, that's the beginning of getting out of slavery. Uh, we are going to be hearing a set of controversial bills today. The Senate Law and Justice Committee heard public testimony on Senate Bill 6077, which would ban high-capacity magazines that hold 10 rounds or more. Several witnesses advocated for the bill, including the families of shootings in Parkland, Florida and Las Vegas, Nevada. But on Valentine's Day 2018, a former student with an AR-15 and high-capacity magazines quickly ended Carmen's dreams. Carmen's shooter was able to kill 17 students and staff and win 17 more within a matter of seconds. Carrying 300 rounds of ammunition, he hoped to carry out his dream, committing a mass school shooting. In under two minutes, he was able to unpack his assault rifle, load his magazines, and shoot up the first floor. He shot 24 resulting in 11 killed and 13 wounded. Carmen was fatally shot four times while trying to hide in her AP psychology class on that first floor. It's only a question of when, not if another mass shooting will occur. Our current gun laws make mass shootings inevitable. And for our family, the inevitable occurred on October 1 in Las Vegas. It could have been prevented. Without assault weapons and high-capacity magazines, I believe our daughter would be alive today. I beg you to please pass SB 6077. I'm not asking you to eliminate guns. Just pass a common-sense gun law that helps prevent mass, mass shootings. Critics of the bill said that the high-capacity magazines were beneficial when defending against more than one attacker. I trained a student some years ago who asked me not to use her name, who had survived a home invasion, which three men armed with shotguns overpowered her and her family and took most of her things. She decided she didn't want to be a victim. The Force Science Institute, which studies the uses of force principally amongst police officers, shows that the rate with which trained people, even trained people, hit what they are shooting at is roughly 39%. Firearms that hold more than 10 shots of ammunition are disproportionately more useful for somebody who's defending themselves alone against multiple assailants. That makes that particular firearm a safer choice for an entire segment of society. So this bill dangerously takes away the safest personal protection op option for thousands of women, elderly and disabled. What's common sense about that? House Bill 2401 deals with the use of AI on job applicants. Meanwhile, in the House Committee on Labor and the Workplace, members heard about artificial intelligence in job interviews on January 20th. House Bill 2401 creates employer requirements for usage of artificial intelligence on applicant videos and restricts sharing of the applicant videos. It is apparently a new thing that those of us old as dirt don't know some jobs uh, uh, are, are interviewed for by robots. Uh, you submit a video, they use artificial intelligence, they use some facial recognition technology. Um, and based on how your vocabulary is, uh, how you hold yourself, what your face looks like, is whether you make the cut or not to move on to the next piece. There's certainly some opportunity here. Humans have bias in all of their um, uh, interactions with humans as well. So there's opportunity here, but um, we don't know how these decisions are being made in the job context or with all of these AI systems. And so the bill before you offers us uh, a little bit of an uh, opportunity to have a discussion about how much we want these systems 
to be in place um, for those and whether or not people can opt out, whether people are not, can uh, have that information deleted, which is becoming standard and we're certainly discussing it here in Washington State this year. A recent Washington Post article had been shared with the committee in advance about the growth of AI in job interviews. Where is this currently being used? Do you know, I read the article and I'm looking to see if there's other places that we could see the good and the bad at the same time to try to assess what would be best for Washington State. Well, um, uh, my recollection is that it's sort of being used a little bit of all over the place. We're seeing some nonprofits and for-profits using it, um, and there are a few companies doing this, but I, I think the, the big piece is about setting the standard for how these interviews are done and what's the role. So um, uh, I'm sure it's being done here in Washington State. I, I couldn't tell you exactly who is using it. Um, most of it's just a private service. You would engage them to interview a bunch of college students. Uh, in some ways, it's very efficient. In some ways, it's a great way of culling out folks who are just trying to maybe check the box on job interviews for their parents you know, or something like that. Uh, it, it's really tough with so much information, but we also need to make sure that it's not reinforcing biases and that it's moving us in the right direction. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name the is The Senate David Local Smith. Government Committee held a public hearing on Senate Bills 6335 and 6453 on January 21st, which would add a climate change requirement to the Growth Management Act. The Association of Washington Cities was concerned about the feasibility of the policy. We think that uh, the Elements Bill has some specific concerns in terms of the expectation that specific actions will reduce um, affirmatively reduce VMT and GHD reductions, how you would establish that for any particular local government decision. On the goal bill, same concerns in terms of um, having a goal that says we have to ensure those outcomes and whether that's feasible. The Department of Commerce felt that the policy would help meet state benchmarks towards climate change reduction. There's ways to get more than one benefit out of this. And a lot of the things you can do for climate change um, relating around um, creating more compact communities uh, gets you a lot of different benefits. Compact communities consistently outperform more sprawling communities on greenhouse gas emission measures, and they also do that on, on multiple other, uh, other ranges as well. So I think this is the mo one of the most effective strategies Washington can take to meet the climate change goals. Lawmakers were concerned about the potential fallout for smaller cities in Washington state. And I appreciate that you talk about um, the ability of any any kind of element like this being able to be flexibly tailored to the community. Uh -huh. But is there language in the bill right now that protects that so groups can't come in and litigate and try to make it a one size fits all? Well, if I uh, if, if I'm correct, the bill require creates a framework where we sort of have to go through the process of allocating targets among the jurisdictions and among the regional transportation planning organizations. And then a local government would have to look at the targets, look at the, the, the landscape in their community, and um, they would have to develop a uniquely tailored plan to address that. Not, not every community is gonna have the same capacity uh, to address uh, that. That's one, of the, that's one of the things that the, the, the target allocation process would have to go through. For agriculture, especially, uh, those in, in the basin, the Columbia Basin, miles traveled. I don't know how in the world you would um, apply and actually succeed in reducing miles driven and maintain the economic viability of our farms. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna call the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee uh, to order. Here the House Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee held a January 21st public hearing on several firearms bills. House Bill 2240 would ban the high-capacity magazines of over 10 rounds. House Bill 2241 would ban the sale or ownership of assault weapons. Representative Brad Clippert questioned the vague descriptions of banned weapons defined in 2241. When you're defining a copycat weapon, it talks about folding telescopic stock, folding stock, or telescoping stock. It talks about the pistol grip. And then uh, the further definition talks about detachable magazine for a definition associated with an assault weapon. And not understanding what a pistol grip and a stock 
and or the fact that as a detachable magazine, if it has less than 10 rounds, why that would make it an assault weapon. The bill's sponsor framed it as a method to protect law enforcement. We're always concerned with making sure that our first responders are safe. And we know that every day they put their lives on the line. So the statistic that really stood out for me that of, of the approximately, and I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but of, about of the, the approximately 100 law enforcement officers that have made the ultimate sacrifice for their lives, about a quarter of those were killed by assault weapons. So 20, 23, I believe, first responders have been killed by assault weapons. Six of those, those assault weapons actually, the bullets actually penetrated their ballistic vests. That does not happen without this kind of firepower. 2241 is based off of Maryland gun laws, which was scrutinized for their effectiveness in stopping mass shootings. Mr. Thomas, you said that our, uh, these laws that we are proposing are based off Maryland's laws. I heard you make that statement. Are you aware that I heard first on the radio and then I had it confirmed by a researcher that Maryland's uh, death by firearm went up 30% up 30% after they passed their highly restrictive weapons laws? When referring to why we based the laws off of uh, Maryland, we are specifically focusing on the constitutionality challenge to the, both the identification of specific firearms and their features. If actually holding the people accountable that are doing the crimes to begin with might be reasonable as far as taking steps to reduce these mass shootings. Accountability is an important part of, of public safety, but the accountability happens after the incident. And what we're hoping for is to give people who are involved in those incidents a chance to survive them. Three other firearm bills were put before the committee concerning local government authority of regulation of guns, concealed weapons training, and public safety measures when a gun owner has been deemed a danger to themselves and others. Why can't I, as a Washington resident, feel safe when I am in a public place with one or more of the 6,000 Washingtonians that could be carrying a concealed lethal weapon with little or no training experience? This bill places an undue financial and physical restraint on our, the members of the LGBT community. One thing that's not mentioned in this bill, in order to do live fire training, you have to have a facility nearby. In Seattle, in the Capitol Hill District, you are 10 miles away from any range that allows you to be able to do any form of live fire training. Any individual without their own vehicle for transportation is prohibited upon Washington state law from being able to carry their firearm on mass transit. You must have a CPL in order to carry a firearm on mass transit. Chair Van Duyken, committee members. Uh, Surface water rights and native tribal water policy were discussed in the Senate Agriculture, Water, Natural Resources, and Parks Committee on January 21st. Senate Bill 6292 concerns water rights sales, prohibiting the Department of Ecology from water banking for third party means. Senator Jesse Solomon, the bill's sponsor, focused on an October 17, 2019 Seattle Times article, which focused on Wall Street's investments in water rights on farms along the Columbia River. My intention here, and I know it's, I tried to carefully construct the language, my intention is to prevent non-user third-party brokers, read Wall Street, from using a, a, a state-created, public interest-oriented water bank for their own private uh, pecuniary purposes. Both the Sierra Club and Building Industry of Washington were in opposition to the bill's language, but in favor of its intention. We are very concerned about um, barring particular individuals or organizations from transferring water into a water bank just because they haven't used it. I think it does kind of run into a little bit of a, a, a constitutional problem. I understand what the point is, but yet again, I would like to say that um, in order to, 
I mean, you're going to hear this like four times today, but uh, in order to reduce the speculation in water, which it's not the best investment, quite frankly, because um, it's not proven to be a long-term good thing in every basin that um, uh, organizations or people have done it in. But in order to do this, you really do need to find a way that ecology can process water permits so it's not such a temptation because the water supply is so diminished and small that you know it's worth so much more in order to do this. So I do think this is a good conversation. I think we can come up with a solution if you sit a bunch of us in a room and we can um, duke it out. It's just probably uh, these bills are um, feel a little bit like a sledgehammer when they don't need to be. This is a threat to agricultural water, to municipal water, to in-stream flows. It's something we should be able to work on together and I hope we can. I, I think it may take a little longer. We probably have some different ideas about how to approach the problem, but it is an important uh, issue we need to tackle. Also discussed was Senate Bill 6260, which focused on native tribal water policy. The reason I brought this bill forward is that uh, the public interest um, bothered me because the tribe's interest is basically never brought into consideration. And by the time a tribe finds out about a water right transfer or selling or whatever, um, they have to go to court. I really struggled about what to say about this bill because I do respect what uh, Senator McCoy um, says. And I, I think that, um, you know, we would all be uh, wise to uh, kind of reflect on, on some of his comments. But this does uh, clearly reflect a huge change in water law, and our concern is that it would create confusion, litigation, and unfortunately, I don't think a lot of resolution. Gross substitute Senate Bill 5395, Secretary will read. Meanwhile, the Senate floor discussed ESSB 5395 on January 22nd, which would implement comprehensive sex education to K through 12 public schools. This is about consent and it's about safety from the predatory behaviors of other people. Let me tell you what this bill does not do. It does not direct teachers to instruct students on how to have sex or how to promote sexual activity. The curriculum is age appropriate and it's adopted by local school boards as any other curricula is done across this state. We do have significant concerns about the state mandating uh, sex education across all 295 of our school districts across our state. We feel that that is a significant erosion of local control and that those uh, closest to an issue like this are usually in the best position to make decisions that are in the best interest of their communities, and that really is the responsibility of our locally elected school boards in these communities. Criticism of the bill rests in the curriculum for kindergarten through third grade, which the opposition says is too graphic. But the question is, who teaches it? Who teaches it, Mr. President? And I think, I think while I understand there are opt-out provisions, um, we much better supported opt-in. I think, I still think when we're talking about teens, um, I've met with students, I agree that in teenage years, those conversations are important. I don't think they should be in kindergarten. The arguments we're hearing today about all school districts have to, have to be um, saddled with this challenge. Uh, parents' rights are taken away, um, that those school boards ought to be able to pick curriculums, that people ought to be able to opt in versus opt out. Every single one of those arguments, Mr. President, took place in 1988 in this body, having to do with just this, this, this kind of an issue, an urgent issue. Uh, lives are at stake if the skill sets are not developed that are present in this bill. And uh, I think that we could remember, or we could take, take heart in the actions of that previous legislature because the sky did not fall the world did not end. During the interim, OSPI did a survey, uh, and I'm sure they thought that it would come back, that the public was all for this, but no, it did not. And uh, the good senator from the 7th District mentioned the percentages, 58.4% said no, only 38.3% said yes, 
and we had over 10,000 responses. So it was a significant survey, and I think this legislature ought to spend a little more time listening to the people. We can quote the numbers, we don't need to, but we can quote the numbers of, sex, of, of the um, in growing uh, numbers of sexual assaults, of the growing numbers of sexual diseases in, in uh, our teenagers. Uh, we see the harm in it, in the confusion that kids have about their sexuality. Mr. President, there are 28 yeas. The Senate 21. voted 28 21 in favor of the bill, passing it, moving it onto the House. The title of the bill will be the title of the act. Welcome to the January 22nd Senate Health and Long-Term Care Committee. The Senate's Health and Long-Term Care Committee held a public hearing on January 22nd on Senate Bill 6254, which would ban the sale of flavored vape products. Governor Jay Inslee imposed a temporary ban in 2019, which ends on February 6th, 2020. It's been mentioned 70, uh, several times we're in the midst of a youth vaping epidemic. Um, in 2019, um, about 27 percent of all high school students nationally had reported recent use of, an, of e cigarettes, and of them, about a third reporting using e cigarettes on 20 or more days in the past month. Then they will go to the internet, and, and just so you know, just because we say it's illegal to purchase from the internet doesn't mean it's not happening. We should not be spending our school meetings and PTSA money fighting this health crisis. We need to be focusing on educating our kids. To put it simply, this bill is not, is not only an extinction level event for adult vapor stores only, it will effectively shut down the sales of any vaping hardware and nicotine e-liquid in every licensed store in this state, convenience stores, gas stations, and actually you've just given the biggest gift you possibly could to big tobacco. Let's start with Jerry. Suicide prevention measures were examined in the House Health Care and Wellness Committee on January 22nd, including House Bill 2411, it would increase the training certification requirements for counselors and therapists concerning patients at risk for suicide. Another aspect of this bill that I wanted to mention that uh, is really important is it um, says it's not just enough to do the same training every six years, but it really emphasizes advanced training and evidence-based practice to build a smooth gradient of interventions that providers have to offer their patients and to make sure there's an effective continuum of care because uh, we know that people experience suicidality on a continuum, and so having the right option for the right patient at the right time is essential, because patients need more options than nothing for inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. The Senate's Labor and Commerce Committee held a public hearing on January 23rd, focused on five bills regulating the state's cannabis industry, including a point system tied to license renewals. If really, say, in, a, in, in all respect to the, the sponsor in this, but if safety and wage and hour issues are the big issue here, when you look at the point system, those are some of the lowest points you get for meeting those that you're already required to meet, yet you have uh, the highest points of 70 points for a CBA and uh, 50 points for a labor peace agreement, which we also believe requiring these things, which indirectly I think this law does require, with no legitimate state purpose, other than to see organization, may violate the NLRA. The best way to legitimize our industry is to set baseline labor standards with companies uh, that companies must meet to be licensed, to sell, to produce cannabis. The Liquor and Cannabis Board supported Senate Bill 6393, which drew criticism from lawmakers. We embraced uh, the general purpose and direction of the legislation. Uh, second, we appreciate the focus on uh, social equity as a part of the process. And third, final point, just wanted to uh, alert the members. I haven't seen a, a sub, but as the bill uh, progresses, uh, should it, uh, we would want to um, work with some of our sister agencies. Um, the, the nuts and bolts of the bill involves some areas uh, where we don't have expertise, but just an, as an example, um, labor and industries may be helpful and we might need their help to implement um, evaluating whether or not uh, uh, an employer has and it is administering a workplace uh, health and safety plan.
as many times as the liquor, I mean, there's about 150 things I could say here today, but I'm not. But I, I find it totally appalling to me that the Liquor and Cannabis Board, as many times as you have come before us on controversial bills and were other, that on a bill like this, you can come and say, we're, we support it. Not only do you have oversight of these industries, but you're supposed to be somewhat protective of these industries and make sure that they're able to have, and they are able to survive. To come and say, we support this, uh, I, uh, that just blows my mind, to be honest with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senate Bill 6269 would authorize CBD products for licensed marijuana outlets and include testing for toxins. We're kind of in the wild west of uh, CBD, and there needs to be a little bit more direction from uh, the FDA and whatnot. And in the meantime, we need to we need to keep the protected space that we have in LCB right now. Um, we have packaging requirements, testing requirements. We have medical authorizations for stores and uh, bud tenders that are experts on CBD. I like this bill for um, a number of reasons. I'll speak to what I really like about it, which is a public safety issue. I see this bill a little differently. It does require testing. Right now, we're precluded from selling CB CBD products in our store. We <coughs> test all of our products in the 502 system. I'm disconcerted that I'm sending customers away into the, the uh, normal market um, where they're consuming products that are not tested. The Senate Law and Justice Committee met an executive session on January 23rd, looking at several bills, including asset forfeiture. That relates to money laundering proceeds used by the Gambling Commission. It would allow them to take forfeited proceeds and use it for gambling commission uh, training and law enforcement, and there are no amendments. Senate Bill 6220 would waive restitution payments for any insurance provider for offenders who lacked the means to make a payment. This bill is so specific for those individuals who are indigent. They really have no ability to pay. Um, and given that, and given that it is for insurance companies whose entire business model is based on making sure that they can address the risk involved in insurance and loss, it just really makes a big uh, difference to individuals who want to reintegrate back into society and have a fresh start, not to have this debt hanging over their heads. Doing something like this without being involved directly in the process, we tend to do socialize the cost, so to speak, here among all the rest of the premium payers out there so that everybody else has to pay. And the part that's rather ironic is it's to the, to the advantage or benefit of the, of the defendant as a result of this, you know, letting, letting them off the hook for, for something they would otherwise be responsible for and everybody else ends up having to subsidize the cost. I, I have real concerns with this. Senate Bill 6406's theft of a firearm had a comment from Senator Linda Wilson, who referenced it as timely due to January 22nd's shooting in downtown Seattle. Especially since what we saw in Seattle downtown last night um, and, and basically what's happened in the last couple of days down there. Um, when you look at the people that are shooting here, and, and apparently these were gang member, members and innocent bystanders got caught up in the, in the crime. Um, I, I think that moving forward with a bill like this where we're paying attention and, and, and um, holding the criminal accountable is the direction that we need to make. Um, with the kind of arrests and the convictions that these people had from last night, like mentioned earlier, 44 arrests and 21 convictions, 21 arrests and 15 convictions. Um, I, you kind of wonder where the where the gun came from, and most likely it was not purchased legally, so it would be an illegal gun, which would um, be a theft of a gun, and so this is this is a good move forward. Uh, amendment number 1029. The January 23rd House floor debate over Senate House Bill 1010 which would allow the Washington State Patrol to destroy over 300,000 in forfeited firearms had two lawmakers, both with law enforcement backgrounds, on different sides of the issue. You probably know, Madam Speaker, I spent 31 years as a Washington State Trooper, and I was also the elected sheriff of Snohomish County for almost six years. And one thing I know about the State Patrol is that the goal of the State Patrol is to keep us safe at our homes, to keep us safe in our, in, in our, on our streets and to make sure that our children are safe in their schools. So 
if the state patrol came to me and you see the troopers walking around every day, they're well respected, held in high esteem. I would take the state patrol's word. I've known Chief Baptiste, he and I actually were raised in Louisiana. We didn't play basketball against each other, but we knew each other quite well in our careers in the state patrol. I would just absolutely say that if the state patrol came to us and told us that this was something that they wanted to do, I would really, really take their word for it. As much as we don't want to see a firearm that was, that was seized from a criminal um, back in the hands of another criminal, we also don't want to see criminals who were arrested that are immediately put back on the street to commit a shooting like the one that was in last night. I mean, both of those guys had felony convictions in 2019, one of them for unlawful possession of a firearm. So instead of focusing on keeping the criminal away from society, we're going to try and take guns away, which doesn't, doesn't seem to make sense. The, the crux of, of our argument on this side is that the State Patrol is sitting on somewhere between $250,000 and $300,000 worth of assets. And they have a huge hole in their budget this year. And rather than auction these guns off to federally licensed firearm dealers um, who would then sell them back through background checks and, and a legal process, they want to put them in a metal shredder. I mean, that's three, $300,000. It's like six patrol cars, those PIUs that are out there that, that our state patrol are driving. It, they need more in their fleet. Um, $300,000 is an upgrade to their range. $300,000 can help um, surface coat the track that they have in Shelton where they train their troopers how to drive safely. Um, this is $300,000 worth of an asset that they want to put in a metal shredder. It's not going to make us safer. If we want to be safer, we put criminals in jail. That's a different issue, and we keep them there. Seeing none, thank you, Kelsey. The House Capital Budget Committee on January 23rd looked at House Bill 2282, which creates grants to convert unused public buildings into housing. What this does is it puts in place the program that uh, would be a, a grant program, although as, as we set it up in the bill, it's not funded yet, but it, set, it sets up the mechanism for uh, allowing local jurisdictions, I would imagine primarily counties, but there's no reason that it couldn't be uh, offered to other local jurisdictions, uh, to uh, take the buildings that they own and convert their use from whatever it was to, uh, to basically a uh, multi-unit residential. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the On January 24th, the Senate Labor and Commerce Committee held a public hearing on Senate Bill 6455, which provides mandates for restaurants to list default drinks offered with children's meals. There would be a fine system in place if the restaurant was found to be not in compliance. There are packaged children's meals at fast food restaurants, but also at restaurants that come with certain uh, food options and they come with a beverage. And all we're trying to say is on paper where it lists the beverage options or verbally when the server walks up, they offer milk, um, a milk alternative, water or sparkling water. Juice and soda are still available. I want to be really clear. We're bringing this forward not to ban anything, but to change that dialogue at the table that some of you may have experienced when soda or juice is offered in front of a six-year-old, the dynamic changes. And often it's hard to walk back from maybe it's not a juice day. Some days are a juice day, some days a pop day. We wanted to keep parental um, options here for what they want to have their kids drink, just what's put forward in front of a child, whether on the written menu or what's said to them, um, changes to just list milk or water. I do understand how, how bad soda and everything is. I know at home uh, we do have soda, but I lock it up because I don't need my children to be, you know, willy-nilly drinking soda all the time. They need to have, they need to have better choices. But mandating choices, making a government mandate uh, on restaurants, you know, it is expensive um, and, govern and, and restaurants should have the right to, uh, to make their menu their own. They shouldn't have government mandates on their menu. The Washington Hospitality Association and Washington Beverage Association supported the direction as long as their concerns of implementation were met. While our members have asked and would like additional options as a default beverage, like 100% juice, we are looking to be neutral on this bill with a few changes. We'd like to see the implementation date uh, move to January 1st, 2021 in order to allow uh, restaurant tours to prepare for menu changes. It's costly and takes time, as well as work on some enforcement language around 
around that. Um, we look forward to working with Senator Elias on this. We also would like to see uh, a couple of additions that include 100% fruit juice and uh, flavored milk. Um, these options are consistent with uh, the Smart Snacks in School rule adopted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, and is consistent with the American Beverage Association uh, default beverages policy, which I have emailed to all of the members uh, of the committee. Um, as uh, Sam said, we also look forward to fully supporting this legislation as it moves forward. Thank you for watching Legislative Week in Review covering the second week of the 2020 legislative session. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter or watch the full legislative review on TVW at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. daily with a weekend review show on Friday and the weekend. I'm your host, Troy Kirby.